All right. A very good evening to you, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the fourth installation of the Economic Society of Singapore's webinar series. Today's webinar will be focused on taking stock of the COVID-19 pandemic and where do we go from here. Before we begin, a gentle reminder to everyone to kindly post your questions on the Q&A section. You can upvote all comments on the question you feel are relevant towards you. If your question is specific to any panelists, please do mention it in your question. As Singapore heads towards a new phase of recovery, the ESS webinar series turns the spotlight back again on the COVID-19 pandemic. ESS has lined up a panel consisting of public health and economic experts to help us understand if the dust is settling from the implications of COVID-19 and the interventions taken in both public health and the economy. The speakers will also explore whether public health and economic outlook will continue to be unpredictable and whether tensions will continue to rise. We expect some of the issues to be covered today, such as are appropriate treatments now available for the COVID-19 patients, when will vaccines be available, and have the stimulus measures taken effect. We are honoured today to, for this session to be chaired by Mr. Vikram Kanan, Associate Editor of The Straits Times and Vice President of the Economic Society of Singapore. Without further ado, may I pass the mic over to Mr. Kanan, please. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you and welcome everybody uh, to this uh, ESS webinar, taking, taking stock of COVID-19, where do we go from here? Um, I think to say that this is a timely topic would be an understatement. Uh, we are going through the worst recession in our history with growth officially projected at minus seven to minus 5% this year. It may even be need, need to be revised down if the second wave of the virus and the lockdowns that we are seeing uh, in Europe and the United States continue, and if there's a renewed slowdown in those places. In any event, the global economy is going to contract by at least 4.5%, according to the IMF's latest numbers, and world trade is going to contract by at least 10%. So uh, for Singapore, I think the, the recovery, if you can call it that, has been uh, what people say is K-shaped. So some sectors are doing all right. In fact, some of, some a few are doing even better than in the pre-COVID period. Think of e-commerce, think of domestic logistics, think of parts of IT, think of semiconductors and the biomed sector. On the other hand, there are others, other sectors that are down, still down on the dumps. Think aviation, think hospitality, other tourism related industries nightlife, small offline retail, right? So we've had a gigantic stimulus, uh, about 20% of GDP spread over four budgets, and there may be more to come. Uh, so looking at this picture, a number of questions pose themselves, apart from what MC had mentioned. Um, on the health side, of course, uh, the picture here looks better than it did six months ago. Uh, but uh, we still need to know whether the public health outcome will be remain unpredictable. We, we should explore whether we should accept more risks to open the economy faster, especially those sectors that are dead in the water, like tourism. When can a vaccine be real, uh, realistically deployed in Singapore? And will it be, in fact, the magic bullet that will return everything to normal? On the economic side, there are many questions. How best can we deal with the problems that have emerged, serious problems like joblessness, income losses, bankruptcies, the rising inequality? What should we do to build a more resilient society uh, and economy? Should we expand our social safety nets? Issues that have been discussed in the media in recent weeks uh, are, are relevant here. Issues such as the minimum wage, more automatic help uh, for the unemployed, even a universal basic income, which one of our panelists, uh, Walter Thysera, has in fact proposed. Okay, then um, on the corporate side, I mean, what, what should future aid to the corporate sector be conditional, be more, more conditional than it is now? Some economists are calling for this. Should the government consider taking equity in troubled companies going beyond those that are so-called strategically important? How will we be impacted positively and negatively by rising automation? On the fiscal side, there are many questions. How should we rebuild our public finances? Should we consider borrowing in an era of zero interest rates are gonna remain zero for a few years? 
and should Singapore leverage its AAA balance sheet to do this? Should we continue trying to balance our budgets over the term of the government? Is that even a realistic option, given the scenario? On trade, how will we be impacted by the shifting supply chains? Will our economy be more closely connected to the region? And what does this mean for our still MNC heavy export oriented model? So these are some of the questions that I hope we can address during this webinar. We may not be able to address all of them, but some of them would be great. Um, and we have a distinguished panel. Um, if you, you've seen the list, but let me just quickly go through it. Uh, we have Dr. Jeremy Lim is a medical doctor and a public health specialist and uh, the chair of the medical committee at HealthSir, which is an NGO that works in the area of health. We have Professor Tan Tong Yang of the NTU, who has served before in the MTI, so he knows very well how the government works. We have Walter Fizera, um, Associate Professor of Economics at the Singapore University of Social Sciences, and one of our more outspoken NMPs. And we have last, last but not least, uh, Dr. Fua Kai Hong, who's an adjunct senior fellow at IPS and a visiting professor in public policy at Nazar Baev University in Kazakhstan. So we have 90 minutes for this webinar. Uh, the routine will be as follows. Speakers will speak for about 10 to 15 minutes each, and then we'll open up for Q&A before we wrap up at 6.30. So without further ado, uh, can I pass the floor on to Dr. Jeremy Lim, uh, Tell us about the health aspects of COVID-19. Thank you very much, Vikram, and a very good evening to everyone. Uh, really delighted to be here. Uh, probably the only medical doctor amongst all of you as really economists. So happy to take any questions later in the Q&A as it pertains to the clinical as well as the public health aspects. Um, is it okay if I were to share my screen? I've got, a, I've got three slides. Please go ahead, Paul. Thank you. Okay, can I just check that everyone can see my slide? I did. Um, as we approach the end of the year, we get a bit nostalgic, a bit, ref a bit ref reflective, and we want to think back to how the year started. And I thought, and I, and I went back to read a commentary I had written for the Straits Times uh, on, on February the 4th at the start of this and, and it was maybe a little more prescient than what I had anticipated and, uh, and, the, and the advocacy in this article was really to get ready for the new normal, right? And I had argued for a couple of things that I wanted to cover four points over the next uh, five, five, or five or 10 minutes. And I think uh, to say that we're in the crisis of a generation is quite an understatement. Uh, it is very common to talk about VUCA uh, and we say it almost, almost in passing, but I don't think any of us could have imagined just how much volatility we would have seen in the last 10, 11 months. And I'm afraid from a public health point of view, it's not going to get better in that even despite Singapore's seeming peaceful state, uh, uh, eternal vigilance, is the price of peace. But even as we manage this, this current setup, as we open up our borders more and more, we increase the risk. And how then do we balance this notion between containment and really normalcy? And very early on in the, in the crisis, it was very reasonable to take the so-called precautionary principle and say better safe than sorry. But I think over the last 10 months, we have clearly amply demonstrated that, that, that caution has its price. It is not a risk-free or it's not a consequence-free option. And, and while Singapore hasn't, um, hasn't shared data beyond uh, really COVID and the economic data, uh, a friend in Thailand shared a very sobering statistic. And this was in, and this was in August. And in August, he shared in a, in a similar webinar that really Thailand had, had 2,000 more. 2,000 more suicides up to August in 2020 as compared to 2019. So, so to all the um, to all the persons uh, talking about how it's just money, we can get back the money. No, it's not. There's a very human, there's a very, very 
clear medical cost to economic devastation and to all these uh, circuit breakers, lockdowns, and and really so on. And we do need to strike that that balance. Um, and the challenge for us is that this volatility is not just at the macro level, but as Victoria Mel uh, but as Melbourne and in the state of Victoria has uh, demonstrated and increasingly many, many countries uh, now in Europe that this volatility is not just at the macro level, it's also at the micro level. I mean, um, you may be a very successful doctor, but if you're in a, but if you're in a shopping mall that is forced to close for four weeks, you're in serious trouble. You may be the best um, X, Y, Z, but if the city is closed for four weeks, six weeks, you likewise are in the same boat as everyone else. So the challenge then is, how then do we protect a lot of these businesses uh, that through no fault of really theirs uh, is subject to the same volatility? And unfortunately, it is, it, is, uh, it is not good enough to say, be prudent, transform yourself because um, these things could happen and they could happen to anyone. So we just have to live with these consequences. And what this then means to a point that Vikram made earlier, that the role of government has got to expand. The, yes, government from a fiscal point of view needs to find the necessary resources. Personally, I would argue that, that COVID-19 will accelerate a push for more universalism. And in my own area, healthcare, uh, we do see um, ominous dark clouds if we stick to the current system, which is very employment-based. Um, pretty much the Singapore model today is built on subsidies and the three M's, MediSafe, MediShield Life, as well as MediFund. MediSafe is built upon CPF, which is in turn built upon em uh, really employment. But as employment becomes uh, more and more challenged, and as more and more of us move into the so-called gig economy, then the, then the traditional underpinning of our healthcare financing system becomes more and more difficult, is it time to have a much more fundamental rethink, not just in healthcare, but across many other uh, aspects? And as Vikram shared, is it time to start discussing sacred cows like universal basic income? And I would argue that the answer is yes. It is time to think about all of these. Uh, I wanted to move on to my next slide, uh, which is from today's papers. And if the and if the man in the photo looks looks familiar, well, he should, right? And I and I thought Vikram wrote a very nice uh, piece in really today's um, uh, Straits Times that really emphasizes the need for a very very fundamental rethink, not just for healthcare or but across every aspect of the economy as well as society, right? And I think if we don't seize the opportunity of the COVID-19 crisis to make these painful but necessary changes, we will regret it in three years, five years time. And I think that in the traditional sectors, aviation, retail, hospitality, tourism, uh, they're not going to get better. Um, the the uh, really IETA um, predicts that things will settle down in two to three years, I think that's wildly op optimistic. From a, from a public health point of view, even a vaccine has become uh, uh, really alluded to would be incredibly difficult to, to propagate globally. Uh, so let's leave aside the science behind the vaccine and whether it is efficacious, uh, whether we can manage the side effects, the sheer logistics and a friend in the medical distribution business said that, that their own company had done some analysis and, and basically said that it would take at least two years to vaccinate the entire world, right? And two years and 25,000 jumbo jets. The challenge is that the world doesn't have 25,000 jumbo jets currently. And even the ones that we have are largely sitting in the desert. They will need six months to be recommissioned. And so um, we do we are not going to see a return to mass tourism and the, and the model in Singapore that has traditionally created many, many jobs. So we have to think differently and the time to think about it is really now when we're fiscally challenged, but not, but not in the ICU, right? So it's still time that really surgically, that a much more precise surgical strikes can be very, very beneficial. Uh, lastly, I just wanted to say 
something about healthcare, which is really my world. And this is a photo taken from actually um, uh, South, this is from South Africa. And let's look at healthcare as a growth engine. And I wanted to look at it from really two aspects. One is that uh, in the pre-COVID era, uh, the health minister Gan shared that Singapore needs by the year 2030, 32,000 healthcare workers across uh, patient facing as well as non-patient facing. Is it time to think about how to move people into this uh, and not just as a kind of um, safe harbor from the economic um, uh, devastation currently, but something much more, much more enduring because uh, hand on heart, I don't think that some of our traditional sectors are ever going to, to employ the same numbers that we have had traditionally. So there is opportunity. And secondly, uh, healthcare outside Singapore is still a tremendous growth area. Even with limited travel, can we do more? And this photo that I, that I shared that, I, that I've put up is really to illustrate the point that healthcare can cross borders if we do it cleverly. And what this photo shows is this is a child who is, who is doing a health, who is doing a screening for hearing loss, right? And this is, and as part of developmental screening, um, typically we would screen children for both hearing as well as visual um, uh, issues. And, and today the the South African company that had developed the technology to screen children using a standard smartphone. So it's software driven with standard consumer goods. It helps to make screening very much more accessible. You don't need to go to an audiologist with an expensive sound room. You can do it in the local community. And this person here is not some highly trained nurse or anything. It's one of the, uh, one of the persons living in the local community after a day of training is ready to move because the technology aids. Uh, what's interesting also is that um, the company HearX is now doing such screening programs around the world and the, and the visual checks are done by another company, Peak, that's based in London. So if we look at just this very simple case, can we ask ourselves, is there an opportunity for Singapore with our traditional strengths in very high quality healthcare? How then do we project and grow the opportunities, not just within Singapore to serve our own needs, but to extend beyond really our shores? And I think that we can, and I think that we have to. And on this note, I would uh, like to uh, end my formal comments and be glad to take questions during the Q&A. Thank you very much. Um, thank you, um, thank you, uh, Doctor <clears throat> Doctor Lim, uh, for some very sobering but also encouraging uh, remarks. There is actually already a question for you, but perhaps we'll keep it uh, for for up, for during the Q and A because I'm sure there'll be many more. In fact, I have many more also. Um, okay, so uh, can we now uh, move on to Professor Professor Tan? Prof Tan, the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh... Thank you, Chairman, for a very... <clears throat> Can everybody see the screen? Okay. Uh, thank you, Chairman, for a very uh, excellent opening remarks. Because of time constraint, I will focus on three points, basically touching on the economy. My first point is that we are likely to see a more assertive China in the post-COVID world and that led to intensification of geopolitical rivalry. And then my second point is that ASEAN as a whole is likely to be a big major beneficiary, but if we don't manage it well, we will turn out to be a new better ground and that could be uh, a place for a proxy war which create serious problems for us. Then within this context, I will talk about the future of Singapore. <clears throat> Now, a more assertive China, if you look at the most important institution in China called the Central Military Commission, in 2017, President Xi uh, consolidated his power. So from 2017 to 2022, you notice all the generals, uh, vice chairman and all the others were all loyal to him. Uh, I use red color to represent him. And as some of you might be aware, when COVID started in China, in Wuhan, uh, President Xi was blamed for some of the problems. And 
from around maybe March, April this year, he actually disappeared for two weeks, you know, because of the uh, <clears throat> criticism and pressure. But since then, uh, as you are aware, they have actually recovered quite well. And so starting late April, he actually uh, dismissed some of the key people, Minister of Justice and Deputy Minister of Public Security, that were Chiang Zemin's faction and put in his own people, which is a clear indication that he actually emerged strengthened uh, after the COVID situation. Then I want to talk about the, the economy impact on China and later ASEAN and Singapore. Now we have to realize that politicians can talk a lot of things, diplomats can say a lot of things, but businessmen have to make money and they have to survive, you know. And if you look at the US-China Business Council survey of their members, you can see clearly that uh, some will plan to move out from China, but the vast majority will stay on because it's still a very profitable uh, place. And very few want to go back to the US uh, because of the cost and profitability consideration. This chart show you one of the, re the key reasons why. Now we have a lot of info about you know, US export to China, China export to US, 20, 200, 400 billion. But actually the most, the biggest amount of linkages between China and US company is not export and import. It is the sales of US company, General Motor building car plants in China, producing car in China and sell to China. Apple is producing Apple in China and sell to China, and that's 600 over billion, much larger than the trade. So I think Trump has focused on trade, which is fair, but I think people underestimated the most important part of the interaction, which is the US company producing in China and sell to the domestic market in China. This is one of the reasons why I don't think there will be decoupling. And to give you some perspective, one can look at the nominal GDP and earning per share. Uh, this blue line is the US nominal GDP over the last 20 years. Now, if you are only a US company, you produce and sell in US, over the long term, your growth will be defined by this nominal GDP in US. And so your profitability will correspond there and your share price will correspond there. Now, if you look at the MSCI uh, US company, you see that the US company actually have a lot more, almost double the share price. And this is because all of them globalize uh, and then especially in China where their profit is very high. And that's why they are able to have double the share price increase because of profitability increase. And that means senior management bonus go up. Uh, a lot of the US retirement income that invest in all these uh, uh, companies also increase their uh, in, uh, re the, the return. Uh, so if you decouple, then your, your stock price will go down, your profit will go down, your, your, your pension benefits and all these would not grow uh, at a faster rate. And this is the reason why I think it won't be decoupling. As you might be aware, uh, you know, China now is actually speeding up the uh, financial sector liberalization. They used to have, you know, control on the amount of ownership. Now, now it is all open. Uh, so banks, insurance, uh, asset management, security, all this can have 100% ownership. And this explains why Blackstone, JP Morgan, you know, Goldman Sachs are, are, are coming in. And I think this is good for the global economy because uh, while it is inevitable that we, we have hawks on the side of China, hawks on the side of the US to quarrel against each other. But if the business corporates and financial sector feel that their interests are tied together, it will reduce the tension. And the next chart, of course, is uh, to show you uh, China's recovery is faster uh, relative to the others. And that has a lot of implications, among which implication for ASEAN. Uh, if you look at the 
correlation between growth. If China slow down one percentage point, how would it affect the Asian countries? Singapore is the most exposed. Uh, if, if China slow down one percentage point, Singapore will slow down 1.3 percentage point, and then of course Malaysia and the others. So if China has a faster recovery post-COVID, actually it is good for the region because of these uh, linkages. My second point is ASEAN as beneficiary or uh, better ground. Now, one should not underestimate ASEAN. Huh? Actually, we have now 665 million people, and this is half of China or India, you know, and this will go to 785, and this will be a very major region that uh, people have to reckon with. And there are still scope for development. Huh? Usually, as the country industrialized, uh, their GDP per capita go up, then they urbanize, and Singapore is here, but Malaysia is here, and a lot of our ASEAN neighbors, you know, the big one like Thailand, Indonesia, all these are still about 50, 50 odd urbanization, uh, which means that over the next 25 years, they could move to 80%, uh, closer to South Korea in the next 25 years, and that has enormous uh, implications for growth uh, for these countries that will benefit us. So this is the projection of their urbanization structure. <clears throat> and as a lot of you are aware, you know, because of the trade debt war and uh, uh, value added chain uh, concern, a uh, lot of the money are moving into ASEAN. Uh, Japanese companies coming to ASEAN, you know, uh, Korean, Taiwanese, and some Chinese company moving in. And ASEAN, Actually, because of the Asian financial crisis experience, they have been accumulating reserve. And so if there's a major shock, uh, ASEAN countries are actually in a good position to withstand that shock. And lastly, of course, if we look at 2030, uh, broadly, you know, major cities like Jakarta, you know, uh, Manila, Hanoi, Bangkok, will have Surabaya, all these will have much bigger middle class uh, people that will become a major uh, consumption, uh, growth, and domestic demand. And this would be a, a, a major uh, sources of growth that are uh, important for the region. Of course, that means that uh, the, the trade war and tech war could benefit ASEAN in some way. But we must never forget that if we go back to the previous uh, Cold War situation, the, the rivalry between US, Soviet Union, and, and Communist China. We have a situation where some ASEAN countries end up being the better ground, where proxy wars are being fought. You know? Vietnam, Cambodia, Laos suffer enormously. And of course, the beneficiary is that you know Thailand, Malaysia, Singapore were not uh, significantly affected, and so we, we prosper. So, so the next 20 years, we could see proxy war, battleground in ASEAN, and political diplomatic skills among the ASEAN countries would be um, very, very important overall. Then I summarize the last part on future Singapore. If you look back over uh, uh, 200 years, you can see clearly there was a first major deglobalization wave. Uh, from 1913 to 1950, you can see clearly there was a deglobalization wave. And incidentally, as you are aware, this was a period of the First World War, Second World War, Great Depression. And then in the post war era from 1950 onward, we see a major wave of globalizations where world export as a share of GDP gone up. Then in the last 10 years, you begin to see a deglobalization effect, which is a serious problem. Now, I want to say, you know, in, in, in evolution, there's this thing called mutualism, which is an uh, important part uh, on understanding and I apply to geopolitics. As you're aware, geopolitics is brutal, is a rootless game. If you look at this bird, it's called Egyptian plower, uh, it's in the Nile River. This bird is small, but it provides a very useful function to the crocodile. The crocodile, as you are aware, eat a lot of meat, and a lot of meat got stuck in the teeth, 
and there are no dentists for them, no. So this meat rock, and it actually create a lot of diseases in the crocodile. Over the millions of years, this Egyptian flower developed a mutually symbiotic relationship with the crocodile. Uh, it come in to pick and then clean up the teeth, and the crocodile does not eat the 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 bird because it provides a very useful function. And it's not due to the kind heartedness of the crocodile. Uh, it is because this small bird provides a very useful, effective function, and that's why it survived and prosper. What does that mean for Singapore? Singapore is a small bird. <clears throat> now, as you are aware, Hong Kong has gone to steady decline. But the whole Asia Pacific, including India, uh, is developing. And this whole region needs uh, what I call a neutral cosmopolitan uh, regional hub cities with strong legal institutions and preferably using English language that is uh, comfortable to everybody. As you are aware, Singapore, we are the center for regional logistics, regional headquarters, business services, insurance, infrastructure finance, project financing, air hub and sea hub. <coughs> Excuse me. More importantly, we are in an open, inclusive economy. So business, financial people and government from US, China, EU, Japan, India and ASEAN are comfortable uh, coming to operate in our place. <coughs> then of course we got deep business and personal network and cultural understanding of ASEAN, uh, China and India. So if we can maneuver well in the future uh, geopolitical pitfalls, uh, we might be able to survive and do well. And let me end by having an optimistic note. And if, you, if you look at the present situation, the discussion, there's a bit of a gloom and doom because of you know, the economic decline, you know, there are all kinds of unemployment rising. <clears throat> There's a sense of gloom and doom in Singapore because deglobalization, if it's sustained, how it is going to have a small island with no hinterland surviving. <clears throat> I want to end in an optimistic note, using the bird just now as an example. Now, if you look back in the last 60 million years, a lot of birds has survived, prosper or go extinct. Uh, some of the birds that went extinct uh, are very big, you know, compared to a human size, you know, some of the giant penguin has gone extinct, you know, big birds have gone extinct. But I have this thing here, which is the Egyptian plover, just now the small bird. Uh, it is so small, but today it is still surviving and prospering. And therein lie, I think, an uh, important lesson for Singapore. Okay, I'd like to end here. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, <laughs> Prof. Tan. Fascinating, fascinating uh, expose, expose and some terrific, uh, uh, terrific parallels from, from the world of birds. Um, so very good. So um, can we now move on to Professor Walter Thizera? Uh, Walter, over to you. Hey, thanks, Vikram. Okay. Um, I'm going to share um, my slides for this. Okay, everybody can see that, right? Okay, good. Okay, so I, I'm, I'm going to start this uh, discussion by telling you a bit about a movie clip I just saw actually the other day when I was uh, trying to get to sleep and thinking about the seminar and I couldn't figure out how to sleep. So this came out on my uh, Facebook feed, right? Okay, so it was about a movie, a Spanish movie in 2019 called The Platform. So what's the premise of the movie? Well, in the movie, uh, the protagonist is a prisoner who lives in a two-person cell. And the cells are stacked up vertically, right? And there's a platform in the center of the cell that moves up and down. Well, it just moves down. Okay, what's the deal with the platform? Well, the platform is the only source of food in the entire prison. Prison has many, many floors. The platform is full of food at the very top of the prison, and it goes down steadily, okay, throughout the course of the day. And there is no authority that regulates what the prisoners do. So the prisoners are free to eat as much as they want from the platform. It's the only source of food. 
And what happens, of course, is as the platform goes further down the prison, there's less and less food left on it. And, you know, whoever's down there has to survive on whatever is left behind. Okay? So I think it's, it's quite clear what the movie is about, right? The movie is basically a critique of the capitalist system today, where we happen to believe you know, that uh, somehow it's a just or perfectly appropriate system to have one where there are some people who are more or less at the top of the prison. They get the first pick of all the resources and whatever they don't want basically trickles down to everybody below them, right? So, you know, how seriously you want to take that critique is up to you, but I thought it was, uh, you know, rather profound actually in some way. Okay, and why do I bring that up when I talk about COVID-19? Because I think uh, COVID-19 has essentially exacerbated existing inequalities rather than created new ones. And therefore, to have a sense about, you know, what is the impact of COVID-19 and thinking about what we should do in the future, uh, we really can't do it by just looking at what's happening today we have to actually be aware that there is a particular context to the existing uh, in inequity in society. And so that requires us to have a bit of a sense of what are recent trends in income and wealth inequality and in conditions of work. So what is already there in the problem? Uh, we need to have a sense of what is the emerging evidence on the impact of COVID-19 on making inequality worse. Uh, and also to bit, understand a bit about to what extent our existing uh, public discourse on trying to do something about this falls short. Okay, as well as think about what is the role of economics in helping to uncover solutions. Okay, I, I will not be able to get to all of these points, but you know, let me just show you some uh, uh, facts on the above. Okay, so when you look at uh, inequality in wealth, for example, uh, what you will see is that there has actually been a large secular decline in the concentration or inequality of wealth actually in the post-war period. So if you look at the graph on the left, for example, well, during the Gilded Age, that is uh, the period up to the Great Depression, you can see that the top 10% in developed economies like the US, uh, the UK, and so on, actually own the vast majority of wealth. And that was really upended by the Second World War. And so you see a reduction in the wealth concentration in these economies after that period. But in the last 20 or 30 years, this is actually reversed, right? And it's reversed um, not just because within the developed economies like the US, the rich have actually gotten richer uh, in the last 20 or 30 years. It's also reversed uh, in part because there's been massive economic growth in developing countries. And that has been a good thing, right? But you've also seen together with the massive economic growth in places like China, uh, that there's also been a sharp rise in inequality in these developing countries as well. And so when you look at the right-hand side, for example, you see what's going on here. You see that when you look at uh, the, growth, the, the rate of growth in wealth globally, or at least uh, in Europe, China, and United States, you see that uh, the bottom percentiles have done very well because that represents the effect of China enriching uh, hundreds of millions of people. But at the same time, you also see at the extreme right-hand side that the top 1%, the top 0.1%, and so on, they've done incredibly well. And what you have is a broad middle class, that would be the 60 to 99 percentile, which actually haven't done that well, okay, in relative terms. They've gotten richer, but the point is the very rich, as well as the poor, have gotten richer much faster than them, okay? So if you turn to Singapore, um, on the good side, income inequality in Singapore has been moderated over time. It's still uh, somewhat unequal, and you can see that, for example, the share of incomes uh, in the top 10%, top 1%, top 10% in particular has increased sharply in uh, the 2000s in Singapore, but overall, it's moderated somewhat, okay? So if you look at net adult wealth in Singapore, for example, between 2000 and 2019, you'll find that the mean to median ratio uh, has actually moderated somewhat. So Singapore has um, a lot of millionaires, about 4 to 5% actually of the adult population in Singapore are millionaires. But in fact, the median wealth in Singapore, it's high in global terms, but it's not that high, uh, I think, um, you know, by our own definition of what we would consider wealthy, right? So about half of all the adults in Singapore only have a median wealth of maybe about 130, 140,000 Singapore dollars. So is that a lot or a little? I think uh, uh, we have to consider that uh, that amount would only buy you 
uh, a very, very modest CPF life, uh, you know, retirement sum. So it's not really that much. Okay, so that is the state of wealth and income inequality before COVID-19. What has COVID-19 done to all of this? Okay, um, I think everybody will be familiar with some of the reports about job losses, both in Singapore and other countries. I think what's more interesting to think about is who has lost their jobs and what is the effect of that inequality? So on the charts below, this is data from uh, the Opportunity Insights project by Raj Shetty and others out of Harvard. And what that project does is it brings together high frequency data from credit card companies, payroll processing companies, and so on, to give them um, a near real time snapshot of what's going on in the US economy. Okay, and the picture on the left shows you the changes in employment by income quartile in the United States during the COVID-19 pandemic, right? And what you can see there is the height of the pandemic in terms of job loss in the US really occurred uh, towards the uh, middle of April or so. So you see massive reductions in employment across all income groups. But what you see on the right-hand side of that chart is uh, by the present day, that is, you know, by August to September, the top wage quartile in the US has essentially recovered all of the job losses, right? So just based on payroll data alone, you can see that uh, you know, the employment numbers for the top income quartile is pretty much the same as it was at the start of the year before the COVID-19 crisis hit. Uh, in contrast, if you look at the bottom wage quartile, those earning less than 27,000 US dollars a year, you see that total employment is still 20% below what it was at the start of the year. And you see a very clear pattern. The ones which are hit the hardest by the COVID-19 crisis are actually the lower income earners in the US. By contrast, the top income earners, no detectable effect by now. And this is mirrored to some extent by data in Singapore. So uh, the DBS uh, financial health series report, which like uh, the Chetty data is based on high frequency transaction data from the customers. Uh, it shows that um, lower income customers, those with less than $3,000 income per month are actually half of all of the customers who experience reductions in income from March to May, 2020. So the impacts of COVID-19 tend to be concentrated, right? On the consumption side, uh, the data on the right shows, uh, again, the US data based on, I think, credit card transaction data, right? And it shows you that the contraction in US GDP is actually driven quite largely by a reduction in spending on retail and services among high income consumers, right? So the orange chart, uh, the orange line on the top of that um, right hand side, that's basically spending by the top income quartile. The blue line on the bottom is spending by the bottom income quartile. Uh, as you might expect, yeah, both groups had a reduction in spending during the height of the crisis in March to April, but uh, spending's already recovered for the bottom income quartile. Pretty obvious why, because you don't have a lot of discretionary spending that they do anyway. But for the top income quartile, there's a large amount of discretionary consumer spending that they have, and there's still a large gap, okay, uh, as a result of that. So what are the lessons we can take away from this kind of high frequency data? There's growing consensus, I think, that the COVID-19 crisis has actually widened social and economic inequality. And it's done that by sharply reducing employment in these lower wage service jobs. It's slashed revenue to local small and medium enterprises because these are the ones which are providing you know, local services which are consumed as you can see by the rich, for example. And of course, there have been industry specific impacts in certain sectors, you know, travel related, health restricted sectors. But on the other hand, there's been minimal impact on high wage, high skill workers because they've largely been able to transition to remote working, okay? And as far as wealth inequality do goes, although I think the, the picture there will take quite a bit more time to become clear, uh, so far we know that high net worth individuals have not been impacted severely. In fact, a number of high net worth individuals have seen their net worth increase during the COVID-19 crisis because they were already heavily invested in uh, the tech economy and the tech economy has been a beneficiary of COVID-19, oddly enough, okay? So basically not much impact to financial asset market so far because of COVID-19, big recovery there. For the broad lower to middle class, I think the picture is going to be different. 
First, the lower to middle class is not generally so invested in financial assets. Their biggest asset is likely to be the house. And there could be considerable damage to household wealth because debt repayment moratoriums, which are in place currently in most countries, are going to expire over the next few months. If they're not renewed or if um, some way to help people pay off their mortgages isn't developed, we could in fact see, I think, uh, you know, um, widespread defaults. And of course, together with that, there would be write downs in the value of housing assets, particularly among uh, lower to middle income populations or areas. Uh, it's also unclear whether the physical asset values uh, in cities will be permanently impacted. I think you know, all that depends on the extent to which um, work and people return to central cities everywhere. Okay, so what about jobs and the recovery in Singapore? You know, I think for Singapore high school workers, the big policy question here is how we mitigate the impact of the COVID-19 recession on jobs. And this cannot be discussed without acknowledging that we have a significant number of foreign high school workers in Singapore, and they both compete with as well as complement uh, local high school workers, right? And the extent to which that happens is, is going to depend on the job and industry. For low-wage workers in Singapore, it's a different issue. Problem here is, how do we restructure wages sustainably? And what would the effect of that restructuring be on employment, businesses, and prices? Again, these are not new questions. What COVID-19 has done is really throw them into focus because for high school workers, the economic recession has meant that everybody is fighting for every job and the presence of foreign workers becomes a lot more politically sensitive then. For low-wage workers, I think it's you know, because of the belated recognition that many of these people continued on to work in the middle of the crisis and provided the essential services that we needed in order to stay alive. Okay, So, you know, Again, the, the, the broad context of this is we have to acknowledge that our dependence on foreign labor has increased substantially over time. From 7% of the labor force in 1970 to something like 38% in 2018 uh, before the crisis hit, right? And as far as high school workers go, um, you know, a large part of the increase in our high school labor force in Singapore over the last 10 years has been due to the increase in non-resident PMEPs foreign high school workers. Even if you look at the citizen, the growth in citizen PMEPs, uh, we have to acknowledge, I think, although the figures are not broken down, that a large part of that growth is likely due to conversion of permanent residents to uh, citizenship over that period of time. Okay, So, you know, whether you like it or not, high school workers, foreign high school workers are here to stay and they're an important part of the Singapore economy. The question is, what effect do they have and how do we manage that? When you look at low-wage workers, um, I think something we also have to pay a lot of attention to is the fact that low-wage workers, it's not just that their pay is low, it's that their conditions of work in general are also poor, right? They've got low entitlement, for example, to annual leave, and they've also got uh, low bargaining power and hence a low propensity to take sick leave. And I think that is something which... Uh, should acquire more relevance in the COVID-19 crisis because the last thing we want really is for workers who might feel that they might be sick to avoid taking sick leave or seeking appropriate medical care because that is actually what potentially feeds another outbreak, right? Somebody choosing between uh, their health and public health rather and their, their income or livelihoods. So this data, for example, shows you the proportion of employees in a particular sector who took sick leave in 2017, okay? And then the other axis is the median gross income in those sectors. And what I think should be alarming to us is the, the fact that Singaporean low-wage workers in accommodation and food services, in security, cleaning, and so on, they hardly ever take sick leave, right? And so, you know, is it that the workers there are superhuman and don't get sick at the same rate as other Singaporeans? Or is it that they feel they just cannot take sick leave because one way or another, the employers take it out on them? Okay, so I think that's a problem we have to think about. Okay, so, um, you know, I think I'm, I'm really going to, I'm really running out of time here, but I think the main issue is that we just don't have the research necessary to go beyond anecdotes in thinking of many of the problems we have to come up with policy solutions for, okay? Whether it's high school workers or low-wage workers, you know, I think the debate that we have is actually really quite simplistic. It's good that we're having a debate at all because we haven't had one for many years, but 
we are fixated, in my view, on the wrong things. For example, we're fixated on linking productivity to wages, and that's overly simplistic because it ignores the fact that for many service workers, like professors, for example, uh, wage increases are determined by opportunity costs. They're not determined by whether I teach more people or not in a given year. And yet we expect cleaners to clean twice the amount before we give them a wage increase, right? We have an emphasis on retaining current employment arrangements, but that's a second order issue. I think the first order issue should be to ensure that people have living wages and living livable working conditions. And we also don't know much about, for example, whether rising wages uh, affect business practices and technology adoption. That could actually increase efficiency over time. So the general point is... I I think economic thinking has been relevant and yet irrelevant to policy thinking of COVID-19, right? The economic principles I see debated in the public are actually the most simplistic ones, and they are actually really quite naive. There's some general truth, of course, to these principles, but the details matter, and I think as a economist, we've been unable to convince people, actually, that they, that they need to think about this in a more comprehensive and structured way. So as with the Great Recession, there's again a need to ask why our research as economists is simply regarded as irrelevant, right? Um, whether it's through increasing availability of data, funding, or incentives for local research, we need more high quality and localized research before the next crisis so that we can navigate it better. Okay, so uh, that's it for now. Thank you. Well, thank you, Walter. Uh, very thought-provoking, as, as expected. There, there is a question for you, but we'll come to that in the Q&A. Um, so before that, uh, could we have Dr. Fua Kai Hong take the floor? Dr. Fua? Okay, can you uh, hear me? All right. Um, coming from the perspective of last speaker, I first asked to mop up and to fill in the gaps because... Uh, most of the things have been covered, the, the bigger things. But uh, forums like this, where we try to put in a, a specialist um, perspective to uh, address uh, the problems of the lay public, I think we have heard the medical, uh, the academic, the legislative to policy making. And perhaps if I can give a, a health economic perspective, uh, because that's uh, my training, uh, when we approach it from a neoclassical kind of a, uh, liberal perspective, we are addressing some of the failures of uh, the market at a time like this, when the tide is down, huh? everything gets exposed. So all the things that uh, we have uh, believed in, you know, uh, are basically thrown asunder. On the other hand, we fall back on, say, uh, wealth economics, uh, where market failures are addressed, where you need uh, a mixture of uh, state interventions and also to, uh, to revive the economy. I think the, the issues now with COVID-19 is the same. You know, it, it, it's uh, basically life versus livelihood. Where do you strike the balance? So can we take a leave from empirical or historical public health lessons as one? And to what extent can we use those lessons? Right? Um, on the other hand, when we look at each particular case, it, it is different because diseases are different. You know? And that's the reason why, as you move on, the conditions, human conditions also change. So we cannot apply, say, the principles of how we tackle the Spanish flu or even SARS you know, and then bring it to COVID. And so the evidence is very, very important. So that's why we need a specialist orientation and we have to constantly and vigilantly look at the evidence first before we make policies. I mean, just as when we rush into uh, tackling this, uh, one, one positive aspect of our responses from, from Asia was good because we learned from the SARS crisis. But we forgot that it, this is not SARS, this is a new novel disease and it takes some other um, scientific explanation, for example, the problem of uh, those who don't show the symptoms, the symptomless cases, you know, and then it came back in subsequent waves. Uh, secondly, for example, if you were to just um, use lessons of the past unthinkingly, for example, the um, Spanish flu, you know, it had also subsequent waves, but that, that time the technology was different. The way the disease etiology took place and the way it traveled, it was much slower. It was by sea travel. And so it went round and round the world. Uh, 
and we studied it as subsequent waves, but actually it was probably the first wave and it was just uh, the mode of travel was slower. But in this case, in the case of uh, COVID-19, we have actually possible reinfections and we have uh, half, the, half the cases walking around without symptoms. So how are we going to address that? I think this poses a lot more challenges, which is quite different from the way we have been tackling it from the traditional public health approach. So when you start marrying the, 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 the novel and uh, the, the differences into um, a case like this, we cannot also hold on to old tools, you know? And the way we uh, look at say economics from uh, our perspective. So we may have to be a bit more innovative and a bit uh, different in our responsiveness. And then to, to study that within the see whether it works or doesn't work. So if I were to again, go back into an economic framework to say first, let us ask ourselves, what are the basic costs of this pandemic? And, and actually I, I asked uh, one of our uh, major economists here the same question when you first started six months, more than six months ago, how do you cost this? It's actually quite difficult unless uh, the, epidemic, the, the pandemic comes to an end and then we, we know those indirect and intangible costs and many, many of those so-called hidden costs no? and the externalities on the rest of the economy. So the, the way traditional economics approach is to do first, try to break it down with direct, indirect, intangible costs, and then to put some measurements into the externalities, the so-called opportunity costs, right? And in, in the case of COVID now, we do not really know because many of these costs are just being passed over. For example, the mental health issues and the longer term consequences and sequelae, we still don't know. We don't know, for example, whether the, old, the young people who have it now are going to be damaged permanently over the lifetime and what are the subsequent costs? We don't know. All we know is that, for example, it does affect the older people at this stage, right? So, so, so we are concerned now about trying to prevent this and trying to arrest it in the traditional public health mode, which is to control it from quarantine to isolate, to detect, and so on. So as you, as you, as you marry the two uh, sciences and you start thinking innovatively, then there are some knowns and there's a lot of unknowns, you know? And then uh, what we are responding now to say, well, what next for the post COVID economy? Some things we know. And, and so we are just in the way, trying to cross the stream by filling the stones, you know? Uh, so if you look at some of the past writings, six months later, we have a little bit more, more knowledge to be able to control this slightly more effectively. Uh, but when it's gonna end, how is it gonna end? It's anybody's guess. But on the other hand, when we try to address it from things that have been uh, written, for example, uh, addressing it from uh, the nature that has uh, of volatility, uh, how volatile it has been in terms of creating the crisis. Uh, and that's why we're all here. Uh, we first have to know what is this virus, number one, and what are the properties of the virus? And then from those, um, qualities, then we extrapolate some of the implications uh, before we rush headlong to address it. But on the other hand, we also know that actually this is, a, a, is from the COVID family and we have already addressed those basic public health principles of trying to detect it and to arrest it, to use of masks, uh, to hand washing and social distancing. So without vaccines, we know what to do. Now with vaccines, it is still a moot point because it's still being debated what is the most uh, cost-effective way? Um, and, uh, and even, but before that happens, before the economics happen, we have to go know the sciences, right? Is the vaccine going to be, be to, to work? Uh, already we, we, we hear about problems of uh, uh, this uh, vaccine candidates and um, all this phenomenon of vaccine national, uh, nationalism and Singapore's effort in trying to, uh, trying to have some prioritization involved with a COVAX facility. So we can discuss a little bit because of the law of economics and the economics are, are, are what uh, has been, uh, are nothing new. They already been uh, ex explained in the last session uh, and COVID only exposed many of these traditional problems. On one hand, governments want economic growth, but economic growth is gonna result in uh, widening disparities and greater inequalities. So how are governments going to address this, this, uh, uh, this in, in uh, equality, so that's nothing new. 
So it's a perennial problem that governments have to contend with in public policy all around the world. Right? How are you going to balance uh, basically growth with rising inequalities? Now, with COVID-19, it's the same story. How are governments going to balance uh, the ill effects and then to restore it? Well, we all know that um, there's no one clear-cut answer and we have to look at best practices. So one of the things that we have learned from uh, policy uh, is to compare and to define it in such a way that we are able to compare apples with apples, oranges with oranges. It's no point using a different tool. It's no point using a different context and then to self-righteously say that this is the way it is going to be done. So we basically are very pragmatic in the sense that we look at, uh, we study all the phenomenon, we look at all the possible risk factors, and uh, we also look at the implications and the consequences, and then we hopefully we are moving along uh, to an optimal track. So I would like to end to say that actually the, the, the way we traditionally approach public policy and the way we approach even public health um, is to be able to tweak some of this, uh, for example, the use of uh, number one, public education, to be able to enforce it in a fair and acceptable way, and to bring in a, a measure of uh, economic incentives and disincentive, the so-called nudging, you know, uh, and, and to be able to have more palatable responses. But it's a moot point how any government going to do it because there's an art and there's a science. So this debate is about how we in Singapore, in our very unique context, is going to position ourselves to, to bring about this kind of a balance uh, to, in a way, to salvage or to rescue us. Um, but it may be a little premature to say that we have all the answers at this point. So I think it is good to keep an open mind and to keep watching uh, the signs and to keep uh, addressing some of this new evidence that's come along and to start tweaking it and to be more responsive. But I would like to now very quickly in the last few minutes to respond to some of the earlier points that we made. I think I agree with, um, uh, uh, to by and large, many of the points that were raised by, by say, Jeremy on the uh, medical and the clinical aspects, except on the last part where we do see a trend towards universalism because those are the ideals and those are the kind of uh, uh, morals that we have. But the question that COVID has raised now is, are we going to resort to the primitive law of the jungle to be selfish, you know? Uh, to be kiasu in some sense, you know, because it, it seems to reward those countries that are going to be uh, a faster off the track, you know, those who are going to be advantageous, uh, uh, those who are more privileged, because as uh, uh, Walter's study show that the most people who are most affected will be the poor. So how, how are we going to treat our foreign workers here? How are we going to exploit uh, labor? I think it will be very telling. And I, I'm not sure whether we have all the answers here in COVID. Uh, it, will we resort to the kind of uh, animal instincts, uh, um, uh, self-righteous instincts, or are we going to uh, pull together? But are we going to pull together as a country at the expense of some other countries? Um, but all the signs are quite positive. The way, for example, Singapore is a small country trying to play a bigger role, like uh, co-chairing the COVID, the COVID uh, facility is, is a very good positive sign of how a small uh, guy can actually punch above his weight, his weight, and also how we can play a meaningful and constructive role uh, has attracted some of the uh, elites and the brains here. And so we are going to play that meaningful to a, a brighter future. So I'll just leave it at this uh, point to say that we don't have the answers, but everybody is looking towards us. Uh, we are a little faster off the track being small and nimble, um, but we have to be mindful uh, that whatever we do is not only for the larger good uh, and, and as the economic principle of seeking greater efficiency will also have to be balanced with uh, being cost effective in whatever we try to do. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Fua. Thank you. Some of your remarks complement a lot with uh, what Dr. Lin said. So we can move on to the Q&A now. Um, let me, okay. Uh, let me go to some of the early questions that were asked. Um, I think, doc, uh, Dr. Jeremy Lin, this one is for you. Um, it's uh, the Great Barrington Declaration versus the John Snow Memo. 
what is best for Singapore. As, as I understand it, the Barrington Declaration was uh, a declaration by, I think, three uh, medical doctors who said the, the best response to COVID would be to shield the vulnerable, that means the elderly, people with pre-existing conditions, and to allow the young people and so on to go about life pretty much as normal. And they, they believe that that would enable the, the economy to get moving again, that would enable other sort of illnesses uh, to be addressed, not just COVID, and it would be a better outcome all, all, uh, all, uh, all uh, across the board. So I, I'm just wondering, what is your view on the Great Barrington Declaration? I don't know what the John Snow memo is, but just correct me if I'm wrong on the Barrington Declaration and whether it is a relevant solution for Singapore. I think the short answer is, is no for a couple of reasons. But in fairness to the three scientists who, who are not fringe scientists, they are pre-Barrington declarations were considered to be eminent, um, um, uh, really public health, uh, really physicians. But um, as, as this debate rages, I am reminded of the Star Wars quote that only a Sith thinks in absolutes. And... And both parties have deliberately tried to paint that it's either you are locked down, Joe, or you are free and easy, um, X, Y, Z. And that's not actually the truth to it. And I think that the middle ground that Singapore has, has taken, which is a very calibrated uh, reopening, is the right approach. We can argue over the velocity and whether it should be five persons or, or eight persons, but the, but the basic truths are that this is a novel virus. We don't know the, we don't know the short as well as the long term effects. Like I would like, uh, we would be reminded that there were a few migrant worker deaths that were attributed to strokes and to heart attacks. But I think arguably we could say that typically thirty one year olds don't get heart attacks, no matter how badly they might eat. So, so we we only. We, un we understand the SARS-CoV-2 virus very incompletely. We don't understand the long-term um, uh, really complications either, right? And when it comes to, and, and really hence it would be quite irresponsible to say life can go back to normal for those who are, those who are low risk. And the, and the challenge is really that if we, if we take the US, 40% uh, of, of really American adults have at least one chronic disease. So, so it's a bit moot to say that 60% of the population go out and have a jolly good time, uh, but you keep 40% of the most vulnerable in. Uh, that said, lockdowns are a poor long-term solution and, and the WHO has consistently maintained that a lockdown is to buy time. But of course, in this era of really infodemics and deliberate falsehoods, the, the position has instead been framed that WHO condemns lockdowns. So the, the lockdowns are really to allow us to bring the numbers to manageable levels and to get society ready. And that really means what Kai Hong mentioned, the classic public health mask, safe and safe distancing, as well as frequent hand, hand washing. And I, and I would argue that in the Singapore setting, at least we will maintain mask, safe distancing and hand washing for at least the next two, three years as a, as some, as really baseline. And we would then adjust on the, on the size of the gatherings, uh, the degree to which re, we reopen borders, depending on better understanding of the various tests, as well as how effective or how ineffective a vaccine is. But maybe just a quick point about the vaccine that I'll highlight is that if a vaccine doesn't offer complete immunity, much like measles or any polio, then it's going to be very, very challenging to get back to anything close to close to normal. And if it starts to look more and more like the flu vaccine, where we need to be re-immunized regularly, then it's going to be very, very challenging um, to, to really bring us back. So for all of us based here in Singapore, I would urge us to steal ourselves to get used to wearing a mask. It's going to happen. It's going to carry on for a long, long time. And where we can pivot are uh, things like stay home notice, how many tests you need to do, and whether it's 5, 10, 15 persons. Yeah. And back to you, Vikram. Okay. Thanks. Uh, thanks, doctor. 
uh, Dr. Fa, would you like to weigh in on that medical related question or anybody yeah. else would like to weigh I, in? Maybe I can just uh, add a, a, a few other pointers. No? I think number one, when we are, we are approaching this issue, I think we cannot assume that the vaccine is the magic bullet. It will be, uh, it will solve every problem. I think we have to address this to say that if it stays with us and we don't quite have uh, an effective vaccine, like many diseases have been around with us, you know, but they have come, they've gone, or we live with it. So we probably will have to uh, live with this, you know, and uh, we have to change our behaviors as a population. And you have seen over history, human, human populations have adapted. If they don't adapt, they die off like the dinosaurs. So in some sense, I think the ones who survive will probably have the kind of behaviors that is probably more conducive to their survival. So having said that, I would say that um, coming back to uh, COVID, which is a, a novel disease, the vaccine strategy right now, it's, a, it's more complicated because we have problems now who ins uh, with problems with people who insist, uh, which we never had before. No? For example, the non-vaxxers are gaining in strength, the human rights movement, and the political dissension is actually becoming stronger and stronger, especially in um, more literate uh, Surprisingly, I know you would expect that actually as the population becomes more educated, but now they are more self-righteous. They will believe that actually the experts don't know uh, as much. And we have uh, incidents of, for example, vaccines uh, doing more damage than others, right? So even the experts cannot be trusted now. So now the problem is whose side are you on? Because it's going to be very ideological. And, and then whatever uh, you do is, has to go beyond education beyond uh, regulation and enforcement, and has to go into a, a lot more of the nudge and the, in the persuasion too. But whatever you do, some people are not going to be convinced. So how are you going to address this as a society? I think it's easier for smaller countries and with uh, stronger governments to do it than for, for bigger countries. Uh, that's that's uh, my view. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you, uh, Prof. Um, we have uh, questions. More questions. Let me see. This one is probably for Walter. Um, somebody's asking, I think you might have seen this question. Data from Raj Chetty's Opportunity Insights was mentioned. You mentioned that. So do you see this kind of data being made available in Singapore for debate analysis and policy making? That is data, you know, yeah, high yeah. frequency data. Or, right. Yeah. You know, I, the, the reason why uh, I think the Opportunity Insights project by Chetty and co-authors is so important is that the, the problem is um, a lot of the economic indicators we have are seriously um, lagging, actually, right? So if you think about the employment data in Singapore, until the last couple of months, you had to wait about three months um, or more in order to get uh, the most recent uh, unemployment numbers. And of course, you know, for generally in Singapore, that number is irrelevant. I say it's irrelevant because it basically fluctuates by 0 0.1 to 0.2% in a quarter, but not during COVID-19, right? Then that's when it becomes suddenly important. And the way in which we, we uh, get such data typically is uh, we use a combination of some high frequency administrative data like CPF uh, payments, where you know in one month, if you're not getting the payment anymore, that means the person is probably off the payroll, right? Or unemployed or something. So you have a combination of that as well as surveys, but because of the expense of surveys, you, you can't run that continuously on, on a very large sample of the population. So where work like uh, Chetty's come in, is basically to take the existing admin data, which is generated by private sector organizations, which is extremely high quality and, you know, because it's what they use to run their businesses and put it together in an anonymized format that is useful for researchers, right? Um, so coming back to Singapore, yeah, I absolutely think uh, we would have been in a much better position regarding understanding what the heck is going on in the economy during COVID-19 if we had such data sources in place. For example, during the height of the circuit breaker, we could have known, the government could have known on a very real-time basis what is really going on in terms of the extent to which, you know, revenue for businesses are down, right? So instead of waiting for businesses to collapse, you can see, look, credit card sales across all these SMEs were down to zero for the last two weeks. That's not a good sign. I mean, if we, we suspected that was going on, of course, but you need to, you know, look at the data to see. So, okay, what can we, where can we go from here? Um, well, so, so watch this space because the um, 
uh, because uh, the Asia Competitiveness Institute at uh, Lee Kuan Yew School is going to come out uh, in, I think, a couple of weeks' time with some insights from this kind of uh, high-frequency data uh, provided through a partnership with MasterCard, right? So that's credit card data that will give you a sense of what happens to consumption during the circuit breaker and so on in Singapore. So that's uh, a step forward. Uh, whether we can go further from that to integrate more different sources of data, I think uh, it's a work in progress, but I think, uh, you know, places like ACI would like to. And if you look at, for example, the DBS data, which I also talked about, that's another example, right? DBS is all this, uh, transaction data and their customers, they put it together. Um, Irvincia and his colleagues uh, put out some analysis on this, but of course, that's just one part of the picture. You know, um, the other banks in Singapore have their own customers. What would be really nice is if they can collaborate, put together the data, which allows us to uh, understand, for example, whether is it just income reduction or shifting of accounts and so on. And, you know, you could have uh, a third party, whether it's uh, MAS or maybe some other uh, academic institution, which tries to do this in a way that preserves confidentiality and, and business, uh, you know, uh, secrets as well. Anyway, so I think it's something we should work on. All right. Thanks. Thanks, Walter. Yeah. 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 Um, Kokoya, I have a question for you uh, based on your presentation. I think you, you pointed out uh, very vividly how, how China is, is, is growing, uh, how China is uh, liberalizing, is opening up, uh, how the region is going to urbanize and so on. So it would seem that uh, Singapore's future would be much more tied up with the region and with China in the future than it was in the past. So do you think we should really, our companies, uh, businesses should focus much more on the region going forward and how should they do this? a good question but uh, you notice why well, I emphasize the importance of the ASEAN region you know India China to Singapore I also highlight the fact that Singapore is playing a critical role in intermediating the outside Asian countries you know that means uh, you know European companies U.S. companies, Australian companies, Japanese companies, who use it as a as a base to link up and expand and interact with the hinterland. <clears throat> so, in that sense, it is not just uh, Asia in general, but a kind of uh, a switch connecting the external Western world and Japan with the uh, Asian hinterland. So I think this is going to be a very fruitful place because as I pointed out, there is a lot of, there, there is a great interest despite all the tensions between China, US and, and, and the other countries that people want to take advantage of the growth in China, India and ASEAN. So so if Hong Kong is, is becoming part of China, and then the rest of the ASEAN's infrastructure hasn't yet caught up. So, so it created a, a big opportunity for us as an open, inclusive place uh, to play a very useful role. That, that was what I, 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 I think. It, so, so it is not exclusively Asia in its focus, but more, more like a... Uh, a switch connecting to region. Yeah. Okay. okay. Thank you, Kong Yang. Uh, there's a question here from, which is probably for one of the hardcore economists on the panel. Prolonged low interest rates. Okay, they're going to go on till at least 2023. Is that a boon or a bane in the recovery phase? For example, it gives government some space for funding, but it drives up asset prices which is another stressor on economic inequality. So Walter, would you like to weigh in on that? Yeah, so, you know, I, I think as with a number of other problems from COVID-19, the effects are going to be heterogeneous. They're going to depend on um, the kind of household you're talking about. So if, if you talk about, um, okay, so what, Okay, so if, if you think about um, the low interest rates and the fact that that's made financing, for example, a bit more easy, right? And therefore it has an effect on pushing up asset prices. Um, to some extent, you, you may already be seeing this in, in Singapore. I think uh, given the fact that 
you know, basically housing asset prices have not been harmed at all by COVID-19. And in fact, we're, we're seeing actually a recovery, oddly enough, in HDB resale prices for the first time in a number of years. But what, what I said about heterogeneity is, I think, really, really the key here, because at the same time as this is going on, I suspect in the background, we are going to, we, we are already seeing, I think, a fairly high percentage, I suspect, of HDB uh, owners falling behind on their mortgage payments, right? So this data has been released publicly by the government, but uh, during the Great Recession, uh, that number actually spiked considerably during the height of the Great Recession. And I expect that this number has already gone up in the last couple of months. And that means that you've got, you know, two different classes of people with HDB. You've got people who may be, for example, um, you know, like, downgraders from condos or on-block sales or whatever who have lots of cash and are willing to pony up for high-value HDB. And you've also got maybe the bottom, I don't know, 20, 40% who are actually not sure whether they can make the next month's uh, mortgage payment. So yeah, I, I, I think it's, it's really hard to have a simple answer on, on this. Um, then I think the other question, I guess, is what's the, what's the effect of this, uh, the headroom it might give to governments and businesses? You know, I think the main problem is, um, is, is actually really going to be whether the expenditure that governments and businesses make as a result of uh, easy financing, is that economically justifiable or not? Because I think we all know that if it's not, right, if you end up spending money that uh, basically goes to waste, you build infrastructure projects that have no use, or you, um, you, you give out money very inefficiently, for example, to businesses to keep them alive, then I think eventually you're gonna to have to pay for it, right? Because you won't have the efficiency gains that the spending was meant to produce. As an example of this, um, the um, Opportunity Insights folks, right, under Chetty and the others, I think they calculated that the, the US uh, stimulus package was actually a spectacularly inefficient way to save jobs. A lot of money spent, I think something, they, they said something like about half a million dollars spent for each job saved, which, I mean, is that a good or bad thing? I think that's a bad thing when you account for the fact that the average job save doesn't earn that much money anyway, right? So clearly uh, that suggests a more efficient way of doing it might have been to give money directly to, uh, to workers instead. But I mean, the debate can go on on this. I think uh, Prof Tan also wants to add in on this topic. Yeah. yeah. No, you, you finish first? I, I, I think that's it, because I think uh, once I get into the realm of macro, that's his topic, not mine. Thanks. <laughs> yeah, maybe become I say a few words on this. This is an extremely important question. Uh, I would be a little bit different in my perspective than some of the conventional wisdom now. Firstly, of course, you know, the, the Fed has been under a lot of pressure to expand uh, liquidity, under, for Trump and sustain the economy, uh, stock market and is increasingly detached from the real economy. Now, at the moment, global growth is weak. So you have a situation where interest rate can be still low and the fiscal financing uh, will be cheaper. <clears throat> but this is not going to be the case all the time. And when growth gradually recover, you are going to see uh, budget deficits that are incurred in US, Euro emerging market and, and developed market, adding to enormous increase in debt. And I would not be too surprised further down the road. Inflationary pressure start to come up and with inflationary pressure, inflationary expectation, the nominal interest rate will rise which means that the fiscal financing costs will increase and it could potentially trigger uh, government <clears throat> fiscal and financial crisis. I am not as optimistic as some of the existing uh, conventional wisdom that this low zero interest rate and free money thing will, will continue for a sustained period. If you look back at history, anything that is too free and too good to be true, usually turn out to be correct. That is too good to be true. <laughs> Can I just add in another spanner in the works? Uh, there was a lot of talk here in Singapore, whether we can tap alternative sources uh, to tide us over this, uh, this uh, debt crisis. Uh. And I'm a, a little worried about these suggestions because we have uh, revisions after revisions, five budget 
uh, revisions. Uh, and we just throwing a lot of money, hoping that things will tide us over and will be revived. Now, the latest which I was a bit troubled is when we actually dip into our hard earned savings because the savings was really for our old age. And along with that, we evolved this uh, scheme of the MediSafe and so on. And now there's a, a big push to say, okay, let's rescue the private sector. Let's, for example, shift some of these things that we have been saving unnecessarily and try to liquidate it or uh, to push it on. I'm a little troubled about this. I think we have to be very consistent about where the sources of the money is. For example, if it's savings, it's our hard-earned savings, and we were convinced at one time to put it aside for a rainy day. So the rainy day is not now, it's the rainy day is when we are old. So if we are now tempted to take the money and to some other means of financing to share it with somebody else, uh, yes, I mean, it's, that's noble and all that, but if you think about responsibly and fiscally, is it sustainable? Or is it just another waste of money? What is the optimal mix you know, of public and private? What kind of financing do we want? You know, what kind of mix? I think that is an important point for us to debate you know, right now, and not just to conveniently take what is around. Okay, thank you. Um, but just to just to come back to the issue of zero interest rates, uh, I'll just make this very very small point that they do not necessarily lead to sustained increases in asset prices. I mean, you see the example of Japan is at zero interest rates for I mean decades, but asset prices have not responded uh, uh, positively necessarily. Um, another thing, of course, is that we are. In, we are going through different phases of the crisis. We have to go through the solvency phase, the insolvency phase. I think that will come later because up to now, a lot of businesses have been propped up by, through artificial government support. When that falls away, I think you will have insolvencies. And I think that could get reflected in asset prices, even with zero interest rates. So um, there is, we are running out of time. I think there is a, there is a question to Walter. I think that we should get to um, the focus on the minimum wage or minimum income, uh, given the disproportionate effect of COVID, which would you choose? Yeah, so, so Gunter asked this, right? So, I mean, he's also an economist um, and, and I gave him the, the economic answer, which is that, um, okay, so what's the difference, right? Do you think about trying to help uh, the poor by ensuring that their wages go up or by ensuring that they get money coming in one way or another, right? For example, through government transfers. And, you know, I think classically, we've always taught as economists that the problem that the poor have is they don't have money, therefore solve that problem and actually wages are a secondary issue. But I've also come around to thinking that uh, targeting wages is very, very important because, um, I, again, there are two arguments for that. I think one argument is actually a more classic economics one, and that is the presence of very low wages in a developed economy like Singapore actually, I think, uh, allows some business models to be sustained, which just don't make any sense in, in high income or um, economy, right? So that's, I mean, sure, you can argue that, um, you know, there is uh, that, you know, basically, if the market wants to provide it, that should be fine. But um, I, I, you know, there's, I think, uh, an argument here for trying to incentivize or encourage or force businesses to adopt, uh, you know, technological change that uh, doesn't rely only on using low wage labor. And that's what we need to do. And that's why targeting wages might be efficiency enhancing. But there's another argument. And the other argument just has to do with the fact that, not an economics one, right? Uh, has to do with the fact that uh, people, understand very well the difference between earning a living wage and getting handouts from the government. People understand this, right? Uh, everybody wants to earn a living wage. Nobody wants to, you know, uh, know that their work is valued an incredibly small amount. And the only reason why their family is fed is because the government sends them a check every month. Nobody wants that. Right? It's not dignified. So I think, uh, although that is not an economic argument, I think the intangibles associated with that are very important. And that is why I've come around to thinking that targeting wages is quite important, not just uh, income. Okay, thank you. I mean, I have a ton of more questions, but unfortunately we've, we've uh, actually gone over time. Uh, the, the MC has reminded me privately, 6.30 p.m. has passed. So uh, I'm afraid I have to, bring it to a close here, but not before I thank all the panelists uh, and, and the audience for your questions and, and your answers. 
Thank you, everybody. And uh, we're signing off. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. We have come to the end of our webinar. Please, uh, please feel free to leave the webinar right now. Thank you once again to our panelists and our chairperson, Mr. Buchanan.